So now uh, it's time to start the uh, last session of this symposium. So the first speaker in this uh, session is uh, Jim DeCaro uh, from MIT. Uh, he has uh, conducted excellent studies on object, uh, neural mechanisms of object recognition. And he, I think he is uh, uh, at uh, the position closest to uh, close to the position uh, where one can speak about the organization and the processing of very complicated network in the Venture Builder pathway. So please. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, I, I want to thank the organizers first for inviting me uh, to get this chance to speak to this great group. I um, must confess at the beginning that my lab works on visual object recognition. I think I've learned a lot from the folks that are here making me think about things that I don't normally think about. I don't have any beautiful rendering pictures and um, so forth, but I, I hopefully that you guys will learn something from me. But I want to sort of say at the beginning, the fair warning here, I'm going to talk about object recognition and um, all that beautiful work on separating things like geometry and surface properties. Um, we don't worry about any of that in the work that you're going to see right now. And that doesn't mean it's not important. I'm just sort of putting that disclaimer up front so that uh, you can criticize me for it at the end. Um, so let me, let me take you through the sort of talk I like to give which is our field, this field of higher level vision, um, as pointed out in the introduction, it's a very complicated thing. Um, it's a hard problem. What's the brain doing in these complicated high level visual areas? And I want to just make a general point that any kind of science, ultimately, if you want to call something a science, you have to make predictive models that take data in some domain, domain one, measurements in some domain one. These, these could be high dimensional measurements, and you make predictions in some other domain, like where the planets are going to be tomorrow at some later point in time physics, things like that. Okay, so the, re the accuracy of this predictive mapping is really the strength of a scientific field. So this is really maybe not for this audience, but for my, um, um, some of my more psychology-oriented colleagues is to sort of remind them that this is kind of the goal of what we need to do. So um, when the domain of vision, what we think about is that we have um, images here. Each point is an image, so that's a whole bunch of measurements right there. That's just one image. Remember, lots and lots of images in here. And we might want to, in our field, be interested in things like extracting these kind of judgments from humans, which we might call behavioral reports or more broadly perception, or some of us might even sort of be so bold as to say something about the mind. So, so here, this image, for instance, we might report it's a face, it's a woman, turn to the left. We could imagine estimating surface normals and all kinds of other things that are not here, but sort of perceptual judgments there. Now, um, my lab and others, uh, for various reasons, have thought it's, it's important to go in and measure the neural activity. And there's lots of arguments of why you'd want to do this, understand the system, interact with the system, fix the system. Um, you need to go in and do that. You can't just work here. Um, uh, that being said, I'm not a, a, a neuro-biased person, so we could have lots of fun discussions about the advantage of this, and maybe that'll come up in discussion. But let me just set context here is to say what we need to do, or what we aim to do, is work on this problem here, which is really categorization. So you take this image and map it to something like, uh, I'm sorry, a face, um, as opposed to, say, other noun objects here. So this would be basic level recognition. Um, and so this is a hard problem because there are lots of images that contain things like faces and they have lots of variation in them and you still have to somehow classify them all as faces in the face of other objects like cars, for instance, which at the image level could be very confounded, yet you have to still separate them out and call them cars. This is the classic object categorization problem at a range of difficulties that I'll, I'll tell you about later. So this is, again, just to set context for my entire talk or how we think about things. But remember, the goal is really to build accurate predictive models here. So when I say predictive models, you know, I've sort of set up these kind of three domains and I've been very loose about neural activity, but there's really a, a class of ideas or a class of workers that, that work on the goal of going from images to predicting neural responses that was um, really uh, elegantly presented in the last talk um, as an example of that. And these are really what you call predictive, remember the word predictive, encoding algorithms so that you could take any image and predict what the response would be in some visual area like V1, V2, or in our case, IT cortex. So you want to have predictive, these are called encoding algorithms to the level of neurons that you're recording. But in our field, this link has been neglected between neural activity and perception. This came up in Sleeman's talk. That, that The somatosensory system has thought about this for a long time, but it's been less true in high-level visual neuroscience. It's been dominated by what I call weakly predictive word models. Um, in my field, this might go something like IT cortex does object recognition. That's not a model. It's sort of a statement of some belief. Um, face neurons do face tasks. It's similar at a more refined level, or uh, my favorite is attention solves that. So, so these are just 
word models. They don't actually make predictions. They're not falsifiable in any strong way. They're just weakly predictive. Um, so um, this is not to doubt the importance of the phenomena that are highlighted here. In fact, our lab leans on the idea of studying IT as important in object recognition, and we believe in face neurons and attention and so forth. But we need to make predictive models, something quantitative that can take us further. So in this case, this would be called predictive decoding algorithms from neural activity to something like perceptual report. Okay, so to set context again, we're talking about all of vision. We can't study all of vision. We're studying something we call object recognition, including face objects. And just to give you some sense of this, and if you're looking at a scene like this, just to tell you a primate solve recognition, they don't recognize the whole scene at once. They might, for instance, digest the central 10 degrees here. Um, this is the part of the highest visual acuity. This is also the region which is most connected down the ventral visual stream. Um, this, and and uh, so I, what, you, what you need to do then is you, um, when you explore this, you don't, you don't just suck in the whole scene at once, but you make samples along this scene with rapid ballistic eye movements called saccades. Um, primates make several of these per second, and I'll illustrate that for you here. So fixate saccade, fixate saccade. So you, you explore this kind of scene. And I'm just setting this up so that you can sort of get an understanding of what comes to your ventral stream engine, and that's something that looks more like these snapshots. Those are 200 millisecond glimpses sampled off that scene. You should have known that, identified that you could recognize one or more objects in each and every one of those glimpses, even though I didn't sort of tell you what to look for. And it's that ability to do what in the central 10 degrees in 10 to 200, sorry, 10, 100 to 200 milliseconds of viewing duration, that ability to extract at least one object and some other latent parameters about that, what we call core object recognition. That's our problem that we work on. It's not all of vision, it's not all of object recognition, but we think it's core to the general problem. And here's a, a way to illustrate that. This is called rapid serial visual presentation. It's the same idea. This is shown in the 70s that we can do quite a good um, recognition of at least one object in almost each and every one of these images, even though I'm not telling you what to expect. So um, this is, this again, we'll call this core recognition. It happens very quickly. We're very good at it. The reason this problem is challenging is that there are, one of the reasons is there for challenging for computer vision is that there are many, many possible objects. That's not really what makes it hard. It's just something you have to deal with. What makes it really hard is that each image can give rise to an essentially infinite number, each object can give rise to an essentially infinite number of images due to things like changes in position size, pose, illumination, and so on and so forth. And so um, you have to deal with all of that variation. And so what we do is when we try to study this problem is we want to control some of those parameters that I just outlined. Um, and so we want to have some control of the scene, but we want to be in a more naturalistic domain. So I'll show you the way that we've generated images recently. I think I'm almost ashamed to show this in front of all the rendering people in the room, all the graphics folks. But basically, we take simple 3D models. We can control their latent position, size, and pose. Um, we can sort of render them in a simple way. We can place them in this sort of um, non-correlated way, just on top of images, just on random backgrounds. And from this, we can create these naturalistic but not natural images that look like this, like heads floating in space and so on and so forth. Now, to us, this is the best of both worlds. We have control of what's going on with the objects. It's very challenging for computer vision because we've, we've randomized the background so they can't cheat when they're trying to do things about what's the object in the scene. Um, uh, and, but also, um, again, we have control of all the parameters and we can generate all kinds of images. Um, but of course, um, you know, we, again, we could talk about this in discussion that um, it does have some downsides. But that's what we've done so far. These are, our, these are the images that we've used. Just to give you a sense that humans actually do this quite well, and it was challenging for computer vision, at least at the time we did that. Here's some examples. Um, you probably saw, I think it was a car, plane, face, car, car, car. OK, so you can, you, can, you can do that quite readily. Again, even though I didn't tell you what kind of objects you were going to see, um, that's just to give you a sense that, that humans can do that. So one of the things that we did was we went and measured a bunch of human abilities in this. So what we're trying to do is operationally define a space of a problem so then we can assess how well neurons might support it and what are the neural codes that underlie it. So uh, again, these are the kind of images or objects that we've used. This is basic level categorization. This was just a starting point. It's not a complete characterization of, this, of, the, of the task space, although that's something we're working on. It was really just eight basic level categories. I've sort of given you names for them here. You can see some 3D models rendered on some backgrounds. Um, and we generated these images at sort of different levels of variation of those viewing parameters. So um, here's some, give you some examples of this. So if you wanted to detect faces from non-face objects, you might have to discriminate, you know, what, did this ob image contain a face, did this contain a face? These are all yes answers, these are no answers in a classification framework. That's how we think about a lot of this. So faces, non-faces, this is an example of one task of many that we test. 
Okay, so again, you can have many, many images. You can co collect basic human abilities on this. We can also do subordinate level recognition among discriminating among different cars, of course, and among different faces. And this was meant to just span what people think of as object recognition as ranging from very fine grained discriminations to more coarse grained, what's called basic level categorization. And you can go and measure a bunch of humans on this, and we've done, done this. These are human data that we measured from a bunch of humans. These are D prime numbers, so the color indicates high performance. Red means they're very good at it, and blue means they're very bad at it. As you might expect, they're pretty good at basic level discriminations, especially when the amount of variation in the, in the other latent parameters like position and, and view and size are quite low, um, and they get worse when you increase those parameters. And you can see they can do cars, some cars they detect better than others. Um, and faces, you know, they do a little bit, but they're really not so good at it. They're okay. They're a little bit, uh, you know, this is in the 50 to 60% chance uh, range here. Okay, so this is the performance pattern to get out humans. And the reason I just want to show you this is that this is 64 object tests, each tested with hundreds of images. So this is a measurement of human abilities, a first order measurement of what humans can do in this domain. So the basic idea is humans find some object recognition tasks harder than others. This is very reliable. This isn't noise in the data. This is very reproducible across human observers. And it's also not simply explained by some pixel level model that you can apply to the data. And I'll show you that later. So we take this as interesting constraint data that we were motivated to explain among many other constraint data, but I'm just giving you one set of what we've done. So now let me tell you, I'm gonna tell you um, sort of three short stories today, and I might skip one of them depending on time, but let me start with story one. So story one was basically, can, how well can some vent ventral visual stream neural codes, for instance in IT, explain core object recognition behavior, at least as we've defined it there? That was what we wanted to ask, and so now we're into the non-human primates. So we have, a, we, wanna, we, wanna, we have a human brain here, of course we'd like to understand that, we work on this brain, the non-human primates, already nicely introduced um, um, by a couple of the speakers. Um, the, the, uh, just for those of you who think, well, the, the primate's not a human, I, I want to point out that recently we've been measuring monkeys' abilities on discriminating amongst a lots of basic objects in the way I just described here, many more objects. Um, here's monkeys, here's humans. These are their confusion patterns among the objects. And all I want to point out is that we can't yet distinguish monkeys and humans in these abilities. Um, really, the ability to judge, for instance, confusing camels with dogs, you know, they both confuse us a lot. They share similar geometry. Um, and you can kind of see that if you eyeball these patterns, and we've quantified all that, and that's some active work in the lab. But monkeys, unlike things like mice, are very much like humans. Okay, so this is why we use monkeys. Um, the other reason, of course, we use monkeys is that we know a lot about their visual systems already. We know about these regions called the ventral stream that you've heard about yesterday, a series of visual areas that culminates in this area called IT cortex. So a series of processing stages here. Um, and just to orient you, neurons in these areas project to regions in the frontal lobe involved in decision and action and to regions in the medial temporal lobe involved in the formation of long-term memory. So we think of these as different neural representations that again can, can su support these higher level cognitive functions that you'd want to do once you knew what was out there in the world. And because these are monkeys and not humans, we can go in and record from neurons and manipulate neurons in the monkey brain. We can do lots of cool things in the animals that we can't do at all in the humans. So, um, so we have a very good model of, what's, of, of a system we'd like, like to understand, but we can go in and interact with. Okay, as engineers, we like to take this system, this ventral visual stream, and think of it, unfold these cortical sheets and lay it out as there's millions of neurons in each of these areas. Here's schematically illustrated as just these dots here. And you have, again, a series of processing stages. You have processing going on up the system. You have intracortical processing. You have feedback, all of that sort of crudely illustrated here. Um, but one thing you should really know is there's a complete map of retinal space in all of these areas. It's less clear when you get up into IT. Um, um, and the latencies are such that, again, you have this sort of largely feed-forward sweep of activity um, with then a lot of things percolating back and forth. But I want you to kind of know that there's a, the key concept here is we think of each area as containing a new population representation. Okay, so here's what happens. You watch that kind of image. And when you were watching this RSVP movie, your, your homolog, your ventral stream is clicking along, neurons, lots of neurons firing in each area. And, um, and um, our, our goal, really, of this question, this short story, was to ask, what is the relationship of this neural activity to perceptual report? Can we predict your abilities to do those kind of tasks? Okay, so remember, this is a problem of building an accurate predictive decoding algorithm that goes from neural activity to behavioral report. It was done by these folks in the lab, um, um, postdoc, graduate student, um, undergraduate student. Um, this is sort of older work now, and I'm going to just go through it very quickly, just so you can uh, get a sense of what we do. You can, when you record IT neurons, this is what you see out of them, lots of spikes. Um, these, are, these, are the, 
These tick marks indicate action potentials in response to these different images here. These are different neural recording sites. This is all in IT cortex. And um, you, can, you can do things like count spikes in various time windows to assess what aspects of the neural activity are most related to the perceptual report. And that's what we've been interested in. And I'm just sort of showing you the data so you have a feel for it here. And the way we've kind of done that is do things like apply um, population level decoders on neural activity recorded from different levels of the system, especially IT cortex. So if you think about this image here, it produces a population pattern of activity. Don't think about one neurons, but all the neurons in IT firing in response to this image, some firing more than others. And you would have a pattern of, of neurons firing. Here's N neurons shown. And you can do things like just count the spikes in a 100 millisecond time window, and that produces a vector of length 100. You get one scalar value out of each neuron. You can think of that as a, the representation in IT of this particular image. And now you can imagine test, thinking of all the neurons here, and I can plot this vector in the state space here. So here's, imagine all the neurons in IT cortex, and you can think of each uh, image as producing a new point in this space here, represented by these dots. And now you can do things that we like to do, like ask how well can this space tell the subject, how well could a downstream viewer of these neural populations decide, is there a face in this image or not? Remember, that's the task that we were asking the humans and the monkeys to do. And, and what we do to do this is we apply simple decoders, classifiers, which are basically linear sums, so just weighted sums, appropriately weighted sums of neural activity here, followed by a threshold which effectively makes the decision, is it a face or is it not? We don't think of this as just extracting information from the brain. This is just a biologically plausible hypothesis for what a downstream viewer could be doing. And again, that's what we're interested in. How does perception occur in response to this? So this is one predictive hypothesis of what could be going on. We come back to the data I showed you earlier. Here's a bunch of measurements we've made from humans before. So now we can ask how well do those kind of hypotheses explain these kind of data and other data. So hopefully you get the logic. You have neural activity trying to predict perceptual report. Which neurons, IT, which part of IT, what other parts of the ventral stream, what part of the neural response, do you just count spikes in 100 milliseconds, what kind of decoder, is it really some simple decoder? Those are the space of questions that we can explore with this approach. So really we're trying to test links between neurons and perceptual report, as Sleeman illustrated for you yesterday. So just briefly, we've done things like record. One of the things we've done recently is record with various arrays placed along the ventral stream here to record hundreds of neurons simultaneously. So we're taking samples out of these millions of neurons. We're collecting hundreds of them. Uh, and then we go, go and collect those neurons, and we get things like this, where we go ahead and count the spikes in a certain time window, as I just showed you earlier. And this is one image again. And this is 168 neurons recorded in IT cortex. And this is the mean response um, over a number of repetitions of this image. We have, of course, many images that were tested that it generated the way I described. And it's not just eight images, but in this study, we collected 2,500 images across 168 neurons. So we have this sort of estimate of what this population is doing in response to a large number of images that allows us to test this question, how well does it predict human perceptual judgments? And uh, the, the upshot is we now have found that when we apply simple decoders of the type we'd already imagined, they already predict essentially sort of all the data I showed you on the previous slide and many other data as well. So I won't take you through all that, but I'll just give you what, what the algorithm is that we, we, we built. Um, it goes something like this. The way to think about it is you just sample 50,000 random single neurons. And we didn't collect this. This is an inferred algorithm, spatially distributed over IT. You measure each site's average spiking response, average over 100 milliseconds. For each object, you learn an appropriately weighted sum of those measurements. And um, I want to point out that 50,000 neurons is really about 150 neural features. And if I have time, I'll say something more about that. Um, but this is a, a complicated thing. I know I'm going through it quickly, but it's basically a learned weighted sum of a bunch of neurons um, over a 100 millisecond count window distributed spatially across IT. So that's a, still like a large mouthful to digest. So I just encapsulate this whole algorithm of decoding IT into this sort of acronym laws of rad IT. So when I say laws of rad IT, that just means this applied as an algorithm of how do you explain perceptual report in these kind of object recognition tasks. Here is some of the strongest evidence we have that this algorithm is a very good um, predictor of what's going on. Here's that actual behavioral performance from humans that I showed you earlier, and then I showed you some monkey data briefly, but this is human performance. Six is a very high D prime, good performance. Zero is very low. 
Here's each dot as a task. Remember, I showed you 64 tasks earlier. Here's the predicted behavioral performance from this algorithm applied to those neural data collected from IT. You can see these points lie very strongly along the diagonal. Note this is near the unity line. These, neuron, this, these population reads are as good as the human, but not tremendously better. And so they're highly predictive of what the human's going to do. Okay, so this to us was quite cool. We didn't have to search around to find this. It just sort of pops out of the data. I'm gonna skip this slide in the interest of time to say we explored all, of, all the important numbers that you'd wanna have if you really wanted to have an algorithm. Here's this algorithm now again plotted um, on, a, this is the correlation of, that, of, that, of the plot I showed you a slide ago. Basically a high value means here the algorithm is very predictive of human performance. It hides in the human, the human consistency. We say it's passing our Turing test of saying we cannot distinguish this algorithm from another human being on the same kind of test. And there's a bunch of other, again, we, I talked about low-level features earlier. Here's a bunch of computer vision algorithms, pixels, V1, other ways of trying to decode out of other representations using simple decoders, and it does not easily produce this, or even neural data from the input level to IT. This does, um, so basically, I want to say that this, this is not just saying there's a correlation in the brain somewhere with the task that humans does that says this is a statistically perfect algorithm in predicting what humans does. And that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a powerful thing. And it's, a, and it's also a real algorithm that there are parameters here. There's a claim that can be falsified, as I introduced at the beginning. Okay, that doesn't mean this is right. In fact, we're going to try to falsify this algorithm next. This is not the end of the story. This is just the way forward. Um, I want to sort of um, give you a sort of mechanistic feel for how we think about this. So IT cortex is a big swath of tissue. Uh, there's a bunch of neurons in there. They're organized in roughly millimeter scale um, columns where neurons respond to similar things. It's an approximation. And what all we're trying to say with this, what all I'm trying to say with this slide here is that you can imagine downstream neurons sampling across this uniformly following learning, they're, they're, they're heavily weighting some of these IT neurons, um, just as we do with our decoders, and that is, w those neurons are then gonna support a task like this neuron is saying, oh, there's a car there or not, or there's a face there or not. And for the aficionados in the room, I wanna point out that this is not at odds with saying there are face patches in IT or there's specialized face processing. It just is making a claim that the downstream, there's a learning involved to actually begin to do some of these tasks like detect a face or detect a car. That's a, that's, um, a claim that, um, uh, that we make with this kind of logic, that you have one organized algorithm that can explain all the kind of tasks that I've shown, including things like face detection. Uh, I will skip through some other data showing you that also predicts the pattern of confusions quite well, but not perfectly. Um, and, and I wanna say for this general audience, maybe folks may be interested in this, it's not just that you can estimate, for instance, the object identity from the image, you can also estimate things like its position, its pose, um, uh, the aspect ratio of a bounding box. These kind of things can also be estimated quite well, and we know for at least position as well as humans can on these same kind of images. So that means there's a, a general purpose representation of at least of objects up here in IT cortex, and that's something we're now collecting human measurements on all of these kind of variables right now to ask how well does a common algorithm explain all of those measurements, not just categorization. Okay, so um, that was sort of um, uh, story one. Um, let me now take you through story two. Let's see how we're doing on time. Okay, I'm um, gonna go uh, quickly through story two because I think most of you are interested in story three. So story two, I've told you there's an algorithm that we can predict well what's, what's going on in, in terms of a behavioral report. Story two is us saying, well, if you really believe that, you should be able to go in and perturb the neural activity and predictably change the perceptual report of the animal. That's a stronger test of the hypothesis rather than just correlative evidence of the type I've shown you so far. Um, so, um, uh, again, skipping this, if we could imagine, for instance, silencing a bunch of neurons in IT, that should lead to predictable changes in perceptual report. You can start thinking about brain-machine interface applications if you could do this kind of thing reliably. Um, so that's something that we've been very interested in, and um, here's now to show you this is IT cortex blown up where we measure a bunch of neural sites. We can co-register them with an x-ray system very reliably on the surface. So this is a lot of recordings from another study having to do with face layout within IT cortex. Um, you can sort of see all these sites here, but I just wanna point this out to illustrate that we can think about going in and silencing little spatial bits of IT, because that's what these tools allow at the moment, is if we can just briefly silence little bits of this tissue, think one millimeter columns, what would that do to perceptual report? That was a question we thought we might be in a position to ask and that our models would make predictions about what, what should happen. When I say we, this is really Arash Afraz, a postdoc in the lab, who is applying optogenetic tools um, it, to do this kind of thing. 
Uh, again, for the aficionados in the room, we are basically using optrodes, which have an electrode and optical fiber to silence little bits of IT cortex for brief windows of time. I'll show you that here. So this is response to stimuli, visually driven stimuli. This is now if you apply um, laser light for just a brief window, when the same visual input is on, you can sort of shut down or block these responses. These are nice examples. You don't always get this strong, a good of a blocking, but you can briefly silence IT neurons both spatially and so it's spatially and temporally precise manipulations of the neural space. Arash, we've only done one task so far and asked how it's affected things. It was basically a face gender discrimination task because we suspected that this might be one we might be easy, able to affect. They're like, the monkeys were basically discriminating between these and these, males and females. Just, it was just a task to get us started, and I'll just briefly show you uh, Arash's result. Here's behavior of the monkey without laser light on. Here's silencing little bits of IT cortex one at a time. The average effect is a 2% drop in behavior. That's really exciting to us because it's very reliable. You might say 2% seems really tiny. I would love to tell you a story about that at the time if those of you who are interested. But there's a reliable depression in uh, behavioral in exactly the way predicted in the, when stimuli are in the contralateral visual field. Um, for this kind of task, and not when stimuli are in the ipsilateral field. And moreover, if you go in, and, and this is not just reliable in the sense that we silence any parts of IT cortex and get a change in behavior, it's certain parts of IT cortex that produce this drop in face gender discrimination behavior. So if you, again, think about uh, carving up IT roughly into millimeter squared regions, and you know these are measurements of neurons that prefer faces over objects, and you go in and measure each region as to how well it might support a gender discrimination task with the classifier using a similar strategy as I showed you earlier. You go measure each of these spots here, and if you just plot that, the likelihood that that bit of tissue would support that gender discrimination task on this axis, as, which is really an approximation of if you believe that algorithm I told you earlier, downstream readers of this, if they were actually going to um, read from uh, IT, how likely would they be to lean on neurons in this region here? So that's what's plotted on this axis. And then you plot the a chance that suppression of neurons in that region would produce a behavioral deficit, plotted on this axis here. You get this nice negative correlation. The more likely the region's involved, the more likely you get a behavioral suppression up to about now a 3% block or so on average over the range that we were able to measure here. So you see a very strong correlation here. And the, the upshot is that those correlational measurements that I used earlier are, are, are now consistent with these more causal measurements here, at least in this first task that we've tried. So I want to say this is the early days in these kind of studies. We want to begin to silence all of these, lots of spots in combination. These are the things we're dreaming of, of course, expanding the task space, but to really test the idea of how these bits of tissue relate to the perceptual judgments of the animal, at least in these object kind of tasks. Okay. So um, in the last uh, 10 minutes or so, I guess I have left before the question period, I want to talk about story three, which I think um, many of you are probably most interested in, which is I, I've been talking about decoding and, and that side of the equation, but can we discover the encoding algorithm that produces the IT population pattern? So um, I've been telling you, wow, there's this great neural response space in IT, and it's almost magic that it can do things like predict human abilities, and we might be able to interact with it, but, but how does it go from the image to the, if this is IT activity, how do you go from here to here? So again, I want a predictive model that goes from here to here. I want to all point out that the decoding work already helps us out a bit because I've sort of told you there's a part of the IT response that is most relevant to these perceptual reports here. It's the mean rates measured in this time window. So that's something we learned from the decoding study. So our goal is not to predict every spike in IT. Our goal is to predict the mean responses of IT neurons in these time windows because that's the portion of the activity that's relevant to the behaviors of interest. So we're working our way down the system. So we're not, again, not trying to predict everything, but can we predict that very well from images? Okay, and now this was already introduced um, um, in the, from the previous speaker um, on the kind of models that we've been using. We did not uh, sort of build this model class. It, was, it began with Hubo and Weasel and then Fukushima, you heard about in the last talk. And a bunch of others have worked with these kind of deep convolutional networks that are inspired by the brain. They have multiple layers. At each level, there's a series of processing steps that people implement in various ways. Um, we tend to do a linear filtering with a threshold and then a pooling operation and normalization. We've explored how much these details matter, and again, I'd be happy to talk about that in questions, but we really think of this as a large parameterized space of ways that you could possibly do this, just we're going to iterate whatever we do here over many layers. 
And um, these again, there's there's this is a very complicated model class here. There's there's a large, but they're but they're biological in that there's um, simple known nonlinearities. There's convolutional, meaning whatever operator you apply, you apply it across the whole image, like retinotopy. Um, there's a deep stack of layers, like the ventral stream. Um, and so what, what I want to though say about this is it's not a word model, it's an image computable model that will make predictions about neurons at different levels of the, of the system. So each algorithm, whatever algorithm, whatever parameters you choose, it can be verified by going in and recording from neurons and asking how well does it predict things. So we think that's doing science. So what we then need to struggle with is, wow, this is a very large class with thousands of unknown parameters. Well, we like the idea of this model class, but neurobiology doesn't tell us, here's the model that's extracted from the brain and build it in a computer vision system. It just allows us to record a bunch of neurons, and it doesn't tell us how to set all the parameters. So how do we do that? Well, what we said is, how do we determine which algorithms to use, which, which one of the setting of these parameters, which specific algorithm do we use? We decided to use optimization methods to find specific algorithms in this class, and then we have to decide what are we optimizing, and we said, well, we believe the visual system was built to do, the ventral stream was built to do the kind of tasks that I've already shown you, invariant object categorization tasks. That was our sort of optimization target. So we said, let's try to optimize in this model class to solve these kind of problems. Um, and when I say we, it's really Dan Yeaman's a postdoc, and Ha Hung, a graduate student who really led this work. And um, what they optimized was, again, a set of rendered objects on top of a bunch of backgrounds. Again, these aren't beautiful images, but the basic idea was to make it challenging to do these things, and they would do things like introduce lots of variation, large amounts of variation, as I described earlier. Um, and these objects are all different from the ones that I'm going to show you next that we test the model on. Okay, so they're basically doing computer vision, even though we're not a computer vision lab. They're trying to basically solve a computer vision problem with this class of models. So, and I'll sort of say something about that in a minute. But the idea, here's a build model that they built. I don't have time to tell you about the optimization that they used. All those details are in the paper. Uh, but here's a model that comes out of this. So now this is a particular fixed set of parameters that has four layers to the network. We call this HMO 1.0. All the parameters are fixed. It's a model that was built out of this optimization procedure. And now we can come back to the neurons. So here's the ventral stream. We can show a bunch of images, again, remember, to the neurons and also to the model. And now we can ask, well, you know, how well does this model predict these neural responses? That is, what's the, is the, the these neurons in this top level of the model, which we might think of as IT, do they actually predict IT well? Is this like IT or is this like V4? And when I say predict, we don't mean to suppose, we don't have labels for IT neurons. What we really want to ask is, can we take any neuron out of here and basically fit it from a linear regression in here? So is this in the, the linear space spanned by these um, uh, response vectors in this model here? So we go, we use some of the data we collect from the neurons to estimate that regression, and then we test on independent data. So you can see there's a first an optimization step with a bunch of images, a bunch of tasks, then there's another fit step to part of the data, and then there's a test step on the held out data. Okay, so what we were really surprised by is that when we built these models, again, they weren't optimized for neurons, although I could tell you about that too. They weren't optimized for neurons, they were optimized for performing invariant object recognition tasks, and this is, this is now the prediction of this HMO1 model, and in red and black is the response of an IT neural site to a bunch of images of which I'm showing you four. So this is not time, these are different images, they're grouped by category, and you can see this neuron is like, don't like this so much, like this stuff a little better. I seem to like these images with chairs, but not all equally well. Don't like the faces so much, don't like the fruits. Um, so you can gotta get a sense of the neural response here, and you see the red line bouncing along the black line, here's the correlation uh, coefficient squared. So normalized for noise in the process, the explained variance is about 50%. So that's really, we thought, really quite good for this high-level visual area where we've barely able to predict anything before. Um, here's another neuron that you might call this a face neuron. It likes some views of faces, although not all of them. Um, and you can see that it also fits this quite well. And here's another neuron um, that you can't easily call it any kind of category-ish neuron, but it still actually predicts the response of this neuron quite well. Again, all of this has been published. I'll sort of show you in summary here. Here's a distribution of neurons at the top level of the model and their fits. Here's the median of the fits. So this is how well on average do this model, HMO again, top level fit IT neurons. It explains about half the variance on, on average. That's um, a dramatic improvement over previous models. And here's a bunch of other control models that we ran, things like HMAX, a V2-like model. 
a bunch of other models here that we ran. And you can also run controls like, well, if I just had a category ideal observer, that does much worse. So this, um, we, we basically have, have explained a lot of variance in IT just by optimizing this class of models for good performance on these kind of tasks. Okay, so um, we can then do, even go on and say, well, look, there's middle levels of this model. We had collected a bunch of V4 data using the same kind of methods, and we can ask, well, does this middle layer of this model, this next level down, which we might hypothesize would be like V4, in quotes, does it predict V4 quite well? So here's that IT fits that I just showed you. Again, the top level of the HMO model fits IT quite well. The lower levels fit gradually less well to IT. Um, here's now what we got when we took the same model and said, how well does it fit the responses in V4? It turned out that the middle layers, L2 and L3 of that model, fit almost 50% variance again, and then there was a drop-off at the top level. So the middle levels of this model fit, again, at a very high level relative to a bunch of other models that we tested, but not as, uh, but, and the top level fit worse. So it wasn't like the top level fit anything. So, so this is really quite interesting to us because, again, all we're doing is taking a bio-inspired algorithm class plus tasks in a domain plus an optimization procedure, and that's leading to decoding functions, encoding functions, that is, transfers from the image to the neural response that actually fit very, very well. And this is true even in intermediate levels of this system, which, again, there's, we don't think, of, we didn't optimize for any task or texture or something that you might think V4 would, you would have a word for. We just optimize for objects over transformations, and we're getting fits even in intermediate levels to, uh, of the model to intermediate levels of the ventral stream. So we find that quite interesting. And you know, to give you a meta perspective, if I was going to have a take home from that, this part of the talk here, I wouldn't want anybody to think, oh, let's go get our hands on HMO 1.0. I'd rather have you take the meta lesson that what we did here was if we optimize performance on these high invariant object recognition tasks, that's so plotted on this axis, um, and we test the fit of the top level of the model on IT, each of these dots is a sort of sample in that model space. The black dots are other models that, that were control models. You can see there's a correlation. Optimize here, get better fits here. And so what we did was we kind of optimized this way, and we think of this as being akin to evolution or development. We have our own biases of, of what part of the models are evolutionary versus developmental, but those are just speculations. And the fact is we optimize this, we get a model in, that we called HMO1, and it explained about half the variance. And what that means is, well, why don't you just keep turning the crank? If you could do better, if you could continue to optimize on these kind of tasks, then maybe you get even better fits above 50%. Um, so, um, well, it turns out we didn't have to do that because computer vision, of course, was doing this at the same time we were. And some, there are, this is what they do for a living. So they're already doing better than us on, on some of these things. Here's our HMO task. This is performance. This is Krzyzewski. This is a supervision model. This is Zeiler and Fergus. Um, those of you who know computer vision probably know what I'm talking about. These were some of the high-performing neural, deep neural networks that came out you know, just a couple years ago. They were performing better than our model that came out at the same time. Again, we weren't in that game. We were just trying to sort of optimize. And they also, now when we pick up those models, they also fit our neurons even better than our own model did. So again, this is pointing out that optimization, even when it's done by other groups that are, are just driving up performance, tends to fit, produce features that fit these, that explain our neural data quite well. So I, this is my last sort of summary slide here. We've I've told you a bit about um, how we go from ventral stream activity to things of this kind of perceptual report. I call that laws of rad IT decoding algorithm. It makes predictions that we can test, which we're now trying to test now. Um, we're trying to test how we can predict human judgments for each image. Um, there's also questions about dynamic and feedback here. We can test direct neural perturbations, as I said. We've also, then on the second part of the talk, I've told you about HMO in, the HMO encoding algorithm and other deep um, convolutional neural networks that are acting as good encoding models that are some of the best encoding models that we know of between images and neural responses here. There's more work to be done here. We don't think these models are fully biological. Can they be unsupervised? Lots of cool directions to try there. And we and many in the field are interested in pursuing that. And of course, maybe for the, the, those who think about vision in the room, this is just one set of object tasks that I called 1.0. There's a whole bunch of other judgments or tasks that, that need to be explored in all of this here, especially this linkage here, and that's something else we're thinking about. So here's the summary. Uh, I showed you that IT fire rates are a feature basis um, uh, on which ob learned object discrimination automatically predicts human and monkey performance. Um, the inference from this is that this is the decoding algorithm that the brain uses in these tasks. Uh, we, I showed you that suppression of specific IT neural subpopulations produces a specific predictive behavioral deficit. 
The importance of this is we can now survey a wide range of objects to deeply test the predictions of this decoding algorithm. And I then showed you at the end that if you optimize convolutional neural networks for invariant object recognition tasks, this leads to dramatic improvements in our ability to predict IT and V4 neural responses. The inference here is that these are the specific encoding algorithms that ver specific encoding algorithms verified in this manner are the same ones that are at work in the ventral stream. And I think maybe to come back to this whole symposium, the speculation that I put up is that this same kind of strategy might naturally lead to explanation of visual stream responses that I see many of you in the room recording in response to things like different materials. Maybe those already exist in these algorithms. Maybe they have to be optimized for some other task. But maybe you want to think about this strategy as well. So I hope that's a take home. I want to thank these guys who, and, and, and guys and girls that did all the work and my funding agencies. And thank you guys for your time. Thank you. So, yeah. Hi, Jim. That was nice stuff. Um, I want to ask you about your, your first inference of your, of your con conclusion slide. Um, I think that one of the main things that arises when you show that your, your model can fit something, um, you need to also show that it's unique. Right? The decoding algorithm. Yes, yes. Yeah. yes. So I showed you those other control. You mean other models would not fit as well? Yeah, well, basically, you, that, 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 for that to be the decoding al algorithm, you have to show that there's not a a broad set of others that would work just as well. Right, and I think that's a great point. And um, I showed you, for instance, you can't apply those decoders to V4. I went through it quickly. You can't apply it to V4 or V1 simulated neurons. So you might not consider that yet an alternative. It comes down to like, what's the grain of control that you want me to do? So I did some of that. But what we really like to do is say, well, is it really 100 milliseconds read out of IT out of all neurons? Can we get finer grain than that? And, and that's so far. You can jigger, jiggle that a little bit, and we still can't distinguish that. So there's only some regime over which we can say there's, there's, a, there's sort of a class of solutions that, that fit that. So even though I say that's the algorithm, there's really still a sort of manifold of possibilities that we've yeah. sort of narrowed it down to. And that becomes the work of like trying to narrow that even further, right? So, so again, this is a, it's a sort of beginning of, but, uh, but it, your point is well taken. So in these tests, there's going to be some 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 conditions that are diff more difficult than others. Just objectively, like you know, maybe uh, the a background is just you know uh, the object is more is, is harder to distinguish from the background for this image than another image, right? So there's objective differences in well, in I, the difficulty of the actual exemplars. I, what do you mean? I think that's the whole point. What do you mean by objective? Well, I, I'm not exactly sure what I mean, but let's say let's say let's let's assume for a second that there's some Obje some images are just more objectively more difficult to parse than others. So that would be reflected in the, the perceptual judgments of this, the humans, right? The, the By definition. Right. The, and then, it, right. But then, but if it's objectively, then it would also be reflected in IT neurons would have more difficulty. Well, again, it comes down to the, the, the IT responses would be simil more similar, and then the model responses would be more similar. I mean, am I thinking about this wrong? I well, mean, yeah, I think this is an important point, right? That's the whole point. Like, what, what does objective mean? You have an intuition that something's harder and something's not. I would argue you're doing an intuitive psychophysics and leaning on your IT or some other basis set in your head when you make that judgment. Because when we apply it to pixels or V1 or other objective measures, it does not predict the difficulty pattern in the same way that applying it to IT does. So that's, that's the whole point, in effect, that what is the objective measure, the basis on which you are making those judgments. And I will grant you that we've only done that for average difficulty of the task. I briefly show you confusions among within categories. But we really should be able to predict for each image, that image is always wrong. That image is always right. That image is wrong half the time. There's, and we haven't done that yet. And the part of that is because of the limitations of the amount of data we can get out. Um, so I, I was sort of, so I'll push back on the point that you know, the objective point, because that's the whole point. But now, but I will also grant to, to Bart's question that there's more work to be done. We can't claim victory. In some sense, if we're scientists, we're never going to be victorious. We're going to just keep beating up on our own model and improving it. And that, that's sort of what we need to do now. Now that we have a model, we can sort of have something to attack. But I think saying that it's obvious that this should be true sort of undercuts like doing any kind of science of this type, right? Because that's a little bit like at the beginning, well, our brain does this well, so it's sort of got to be in there, so then what's the point of going in to record anything, right? That, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I do, if you want to push back on that, but. Yeah, okay. Okay, so 
Uh, yeah, work is excellent, but uh, I can't have feeling that there's something that you, your method, uh, your result seems to confirm something that we already ex expect. You know, ID is object recognition, and uh, V4 is something that you know needs to uh, extract some, a kind of a higher level, you know, form information or something. So, the, is it how much it is related to your choice of a task? I mean. Well, so how much you know your results can su well, surprise wait. us? So you said two things there. One, first you said you confirmed what I already believe, and then you said, but I don't think you chose the task right. So, uh, which is the which one should I? There seem to be pulling in opposite directions. So which which should I take first? Oh, uh, sorry. So so the, my feeling is that the, yeah, you you are without you know the bridge convince me that what is something that we never expect you know what the, is there anything in the results that you know that we never expect well i i think all of us unless we're dualists we believe somewhere in the brain supports our ability to do these tasks and the question for neuroscientists is exactly what part of the brain and exactly how supports these tasks and i'm putting up a hypothesis that's more precise than saying IT supports these tasks. It's a specific way of looking at IT that supports this task. So, so probably the, my question is that if you completed, you know, do, doing a completely different task and completely different annotation and uh, starting from that one, and uh, right. then you will so, get a completely so, different result. So, so that's a good direction. And so again, we had 64 tasks up there. Uh -huh. so, so we already had picked a lot of tasks, depending how you want to define tasks. There were 64 measurements of different tasks. Uh -huh. Now, we can also, I mentioned the latent variables, like other judgments on the objects, some of those might not work, and that will be interesting. We could then either say, well, either we've got the wrong code or the wrong area. There'll be different ways to interpret that. It's not like IT is going to do everything. Um, so I, I think that's a, that's a useful direction going forward, how many tasks can be absorbed by this model. What we like right now is it's a relatively simple idea that seems to capture a lot of data. And rather than an ad hoc, this neuron does this and that, we could, you know, we have some traction there, it feels like. And so now we have something to attack in the way you described. That's when I said object recognition 2.0. You know, uh, we're open minded about what tasks to do next, but we, we have our own ideas, but I'd love to hear yours as well. So that's a great direction. Okay. Thank you, Greg. Uh, may, um, may I ask uh, about the question of the recording message? So you show some of uh, the picture, you implanted it, uh, the remote uh, of the array on the surface of the three ID arrays, but the, did you implant three electric arrays on one monkey? We, uh, like yeah, typically from th the we planted three arrays. There were two monkeys in the study that I showed at the beginning. We planted three arrays in each monkey. Two were in IT and one was in V4 in each mm. monkey. Okay. Um, and then we pooled the IT data from both monkeys for everything that okay, I showed so you. So the simultaneous recording is not so uh, critical for... And, and for I do have a whole slide on that. Many people think that, oh, simultaneous recording, you're going to eke out more information or it's going to be worse or better. People have whole debates. There's a whole cottage industry about that. It turns out in our hands not to matter much at all okay. for predicting these kind of task performances. Okay. And um, another question is uh, why the, uh, the other type of convolution network provide better prediction performance and uh, can you guess what kind of factor contribute to improve the you, you mean why for instance Krzyzewski yeah. or Ferguson's either predict neurons better than yeah. the HMO the reason is the one I said oh, it's yeah. better oh, at the it. task I'm so sorry it's better at object recognition object but the, what kind of the connection or what kind of architecture make difference it's the specifics of how they're setting the weightings in their nonlinear parameters within the arch within the model class that that, that those are the detail, all those thousands of parameters in each of those models is what determines an exact model, right? They're all of the same sort of class, but those details matter. And um, the meta point again is that the better you make it at performance of the task, the better the thing fits the neurons that we're recording from the brain. So uh -huh. I can't say anything more than that at the moment. Uh, okay, so but, but the, probably this is the kind of the, the way we, we should go, but the, uh, you know, we, we want to know what what kind of uh, model is the better model for the IT neurons. So, can, can you tell some of some comment about that? Yeah, I, I unfortunately, I mean, you're getting into like how we take these models apart, and uh, you and I think had a long discussion about that last night. So, <laughs> right now, what I can tell you is the better performing model is the better model of the neurons. So. I still think that's an advance. You may feel as a, as a neuroscientist that's not an advance, that that's sort of computer vision or engineering leading neuroscience, but it's just the reality of where the field is. I mean, I don't, what do we do next? I mean, we can start to take apart these models. We can keep optimizing performance. My group's more interested in the latter, is making, trying to be, optimize performance, expand the task space to get even better predictions, but 
people can make different choices. Um, so I don't, I don't, I, I don't know. I'll, I, I'll, I've told you what I know at the at the moment. So I wish I could tell you the answer. Okay. Uh, so we have to move on to the uh, next talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.